Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome today to our collaboration webinar. Apologies for starting a few minutes late there. Um, just as we get going, I would just, my name is Louise Martin, and this is uh, coming from Estate Living. Um, just as we get going, I just wanted to quickly run through a little bit of uh, housekeeping before I introduce the panel and we get the, the webinar going. Um, if you have a look at, and I'm sure by now, <laughs> the number of Zoom, the Zoom events we've been on, I'm sure everybody knows this, but you never know. Um, if you have a look at the, your screen, you'll see that there's a box there that says chat. Um, this is for you to send your questions, add information, have your comments. If there's anything specific that you would like us to cover, we, this is the opportunity to either pop it in that chat group or to um, add it to the Q&A, which is down at the bottom as well. During the course of the event, we will host a few polls. Um, these polls, uh, we will send that information out at the end of the event. And the polls are just really questions, as you can see one's come up now, questions that can um, just guide us and get an understanding of, of what you're thinking um, and, and, and what, you know, what sort of concerns that you might have and where you are as, as an industry. So as we've discussed, uh, this particular webinar I'm very, very excited about it. And it's been a, a, you know, we have to thank the Huawei and all of the panelists that are participating. It's been a journey to get everybody together. And I think we have really got a phenomenal panel and we are really representing um, all sides of this market that are so important when it comes to looking at a collaboration, a framework, um, you know, this, this particular webinar will not end here. The information that we gather will then be translated into a white paper that will be launched at the Digital Council Conference taking place in November. And so it really is a collaboration that's going to be going somewhere. So to, to start the event off, let me, let me introduce our panel. Um, representing Huawei is uh, Marius Engelbrecht, who really is the power behind a lot of what we're doing today. Um, he spearheaded this campaign and uh, he's brought us all here together. We're very, very pleased to have him and he's going to be chatting about uh, how this framework has worked on an international scale and where he sees it going from in a South African context. Uh, representing the Digital Council Africa, but but a, a senior member of Metro Fiber is Eugene Slubbert, and he is here today to tell you what the council's doing and what are some of the sort of key areas that can be um, discussed and unpacked. Uh, we're very, very, very pleased to have him here, and thank you so much for putting the time aside to be with us. Um, nothing means anything if we don't have a roundtable discussion, and so. Having Salga here today on the panel has really been something that we are very proud of. Um, Moses has come through and um, he is representing as a senior member of um, Salga, as a director of, of Salga. Um, and he's going to be talking about local government perspective. And, and that is a, a key um, a part of what is happening within our landscape. Um, it is one thing to talk about fiber and pre-deployment, but how does this, who does the work? And how do we take the message across to the folks into the building sector that are going to be part of this pre-deployment? And Nurse Shabalala is coming through today. She is representing the HNBRC, and they're gonna look at what's happening from a building sector. Uh, Mike Foss from OpenServe is here with us today. And uh, again, it's, the operators are able to unpack some of the issues that they have from their side so that we have a clearer picture. And then, of course, rounding up the panel is uh, Eugene, who's from Eland Group. And, um, and they are a very, very successful, large-scale developer that has sustainability and infrastructure on the front of their, um, in the front of their mind and has always developed with this type of future proofing, um, you know, future proofing mindset. So let, let, without further ado, let me hand you over to Marius. Marius, thank you so much again for assisting us putting this together and, uh, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts on this collaboration. 
Thank you, Louise. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's always a privilege to speak to customers and stakeholders. And this is a very important topic. I think with the advent of COVID-19 and uh, all of the challenges that we face and working from home and education and ensuring continuity, there's, there's really a spotlight on what needs to happen within industry to ensure that we can guarantee connectivity. So I've got a number of slides. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so on a very high level, I'm just going to discuss some of the, the international um, uh, innovations and corporations that we've seen that allows for the, um, the industry then to, to benefit from connectivity. So what we see, uh, and one of, the, one of the prime cases on a global scale is the, 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 the case that we have in the UK between Open Reach and, and the Buildings so Builders Association, where they've come together, they've, they've collaborated resources to ensure that ultimately we can look at what we refer to as pre-provisioning. So in those areas where we know that new builds are going to take place, we want to get in there and we want to collaborate to get the infrastructure in place. We all know that, especially on the civil side, um, there's a lot of costs involved and there's a lot of time constraints that actually prohibits us from effectively deploying fibers that once the people move into those areas and into those dwellings. So um, I'm not going to go into too much detail around it, but it's all about talking to one another, understanding um, the stakeholders involved, looking at the different models um, and assigning the responsibilities to the right areas where it is supposed to be. So if you can go move to the next slide, please, um, you will see that I have uh, there's a summary there of what exactly the, the commitment is from each one of the, the stakeholders in this specific case. So we have an example here that shows that um, you look at an online registration mechanism that obviously is way more efficient than the traditional way of doing things. Uh, you're looking at commitment um, to the home owners, uh, to the association that gives them a sort of a rate card and a guidance that shows us um, in terms of the, the costs involved, et cetera, et cetera. But, but again, I think the purpose of today is to start asking the types of questions around how can we implement this in a local context in South Africa? Who do we need to talk to? Um, and, and, and what are the type of aspects that we need to consider? Because we can all know, or we all should know hopefully that fiber can be very, very complex. Um, and, and we need to unpack it and ensure that we address uh, each and every of one of those segments that ultimately will allow us to provide those connectivity because that's what it boils down to. It's getting the fibers in the ground and getting the connectivity to the consumers um, as quick as we possibly can. If you can move to the next slide, it gives you just an overall idea of um, what the architecture looks like. Now, again, we have certain uh, different scenarios, the horses for courses, depending on the type of dwelling, uh, depending on the exact area where it is. Um, and, and we need to unpack these things. So I, I've just got, I don't want to go into too much technical detail, but um, you can see it can be quite complex. And if we move to the next slide, you will note, um, this is just an example of an equipment room um, that, that can typically be involved. Again, we need to understand horses for horses. How do we do it? Um, and the next slide then as well uh, shows us the, um, the facilities construction, um, the splicing mechanisms and methodologies that, 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 that has changed from the way we used to do things traditionally. That again allows much better connectivity uh, when we get to these types of dwellings and estates. Um, and we're going to hopefully uh, dig a little bit deeper today, if I can use that, that word. Um, and if we move to the next slide as well, you're going to see, but we have to ensure that we have that end-to-end -end, uh, value chain addressed. So even when it comes to the actual connectivity within the dwelling, who are the people we need to, what type of partnerships do we need to collaborate um, and, and talk with to ensure that, that ultimately we do it on the scale that it is supposed to be. So the next slide that is also a very important uh, one that we need to consider is, is what happens in terms of the final acceptance. Where does the responsibility lie? Um, 
to ensure that the, the quality of the product that we've delivered to the customer is of such a nature that we can guarantee uh, quality of service and quality of connectivity and experience that the customers are, are coming to expect. And then um, the next slide, it just gives us a little bit of an idea of, of how we can look at it in terms of um, assigning the responsibility. And that's we, what we would like to establish ultimately is to get the relevant documentation in place and stakeholders cooperation to the point where everybody is clear on, on where does my responsibility start as an operator, as local council or government maybe, um, as, as an, uh, a service provider, or even you know if I'm actually just contracted to do the civil part in collaboration with uh, the developments, but then also overall, as we as we as you've mentioned, is the importance of the building societies as well to ensure that that the skills are at such a level that we can uh, we can deliver on on our promises. So this is just um, on a high level one of the examples. If we go to the next slide. Let me just go to the next slide and then we'll see there. So, so the key considerations is, is, is then really then we can we can start off with this. We can expand it. Uh, we can we need to look at what what do we what needs to be made mandatory? What do we need to bring into local legislation or bylaws to actually support? What entities will be involved? What are the types of policies? procedures that needs to be um, maybe enhanced or developed. And, and there's many, many cases out there, global cases at this point, and strengths from organizations that we can consolidate and we can come together in the industry and we can support you. And then also, as you can see, number four, they provide a mechanism for, for dispute settlement because um, things don't always go according to plan, but make sure that we've got a mechanism that ultimately address the fallouts and the concerns again to ensure the success uh, for the industry and we can we can we can all stimulate that gdp growth uh, and continuity of business business that we are looking forward to my last slide um, is then literally just an example of a case of what they've done in singapore uh, also a very significant growth and amazing connectivity in some of the, the Asian countries that we've seen. And as we can see over there, it's, it happened over, over a number of years. Um, and I don't think we have that luxury anymore. Uh, we really would like to get it as done as soon as possible. But, but it shows us there are ways and mechanisms and possibilities whereby the industry can come together, cooperate to the benefit of everybody. And that in short is then just my, my story for today. And I'm really looking forward to um, some of the discussions and some of the content that the other stakeholders will share. Uh, thank you for that, Louise. Thank you, Marius. So just to, so the, from your perspective um, and from the perspective of Huawei, um, you see that the, that a collaborate, a collaborative model is the best possible option or the best possible case scenario. Um, so this collaboration uh, that you've shown to us as case studies that you've shown today, what's happening in the UK or Singapore and China across the world, where the building sector, the developers, the property sector, telcos have got together. Um, you, maybe you could, have you seen, uh, is this success gaugeable? As has, is, can you see the success of these um, of of this type of collaboration and has the success empowered people and provided more employment employment because we look at growth um but do you see it providing more employment is there is this the do the numbers reflect that absolutely you know in countries like china if i if i go to the 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 isp or the operator in the morning and i order a fiber connectivity to my my dwelling it could be in a multi-dwelling building or wherever. If it's not switched on by tonight when I get home, there's, there's reper repercussions. So there's penalties, um, but they're very, very strict in terms of that. And because as well, it's a very, very competitive environment. Um, you know, even where I stay in, in Gauteng between, and, and I stay just between Joburg and, and, and Twane in, in uh, the Midrand area, Centurion area, um, I, I had to wait for fiber for two years. I moved into a new, a new uh, estate 
uh, there were actually some infrastructure available, but for, for two years, I wasn't able to connect. There wasn't any copper available. Um, I had an alternative of a fixed wireless access of what was throttled, but there's definitely, we can see now, and, and like I've said initially, with, with COVID-19 ha happening and people considering what we what we call the, the, the semi-grating then from the metropolitans, maybe to smaller municipality areas, which again opens up new opportunities of skills and development in those areas. But I cannot connect there, I cannot move there if I don't have the connectivity because my job continuity needs to be established. I still need to be able to work remotely. And, and I fear to say, um, if, if, if it wasn't for connectivity, I don't think my contract with Huawei would have been renewed because I wouldn't have been able to continue my job and engage with our customers and stakeholders. So thank God for the fiber that I do have today. But this is going to, the demand is going to grow at such a pace with the new solutions and technologies that are coming to the fore. And we just cannot do it with fiber anymore. You know, why should it be different for me? Um, I wrote an exam the other day with a university in the United States of America via Zoom. But if I if we move 80 kilometers outside of where I stay, those persons don't have the same capability or why? We need to start asking these questions. Um, when we want to talk entrepreneurship, we want to talk job creation, all of these things we cannot do in isolation without connectivity. And fiber is the critical, critical infrastructure that will allow us all of these things that we dream for. Um, so, so they are definite. There's a lot of papers out there, um, international papers uh, from uh, from various organisations that showcase us uh, on how we have we have been able to to um, with the uptake of technology and with providing the connectivity, then stimulate all sectors um, of of government and 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 and, and, and industry. Absolutely, yeah. I agree with you. The digital divide has never been so apparent as it is at the moment. Um, so I with that in mind, uh, let us move on to our, our next presenter. Um, Eugene, this, uh, this is absolutely, you know, I think what the Digital Council has been pioneering for a number of years. And, I, and I, you know, if I recall back to 2016, when there was the initial land grab and a certain, a certain sectors were, you know, was, were first uh, targeted when it came to uh, fiber infrastructure, misinformation, miscommunication, a lack of understanding in the market of what fiber really meant. And it's taken a number of uh, years to get from where we are now to where we were. And, and, and we can see that growth and development absolutely. Um, where do you see the role of the Digital Council? Or what do you see the role of the Digital Council playing as we move into a more collaborative framework? How do they intend to support this idea? If I, if I can hand over the floor to, to Eugene. Thank you, Louis. I appreciate the opportunity to introduce the Digital Council uh, to all the participants in this uh, webinar. And, uh, uh, it is uh, definitely uh, a matter that is, is, is very important for the Digital Council uh, uh, is the pre-installment, the pre-fibering of new developments. And that is the way that we are really going to build out to a, a broadband connected uh, nation as such, Dana. Uh, can you just please, the next slide. <clears throat> Now, uh, just to some background on the DCA, the Digital Council, it was originally established in uh, 2010. It was about five or six members on it as the FTTX Council Africa. Why it was called the FTTX Council Africa, there is a, a number of FTTX councils all over the world. There's the FTTX Council uh, uh, in Europe. There's the FT, uh, FTTX Council in Asia. Uh, Pacific, there's the STTA uh, uh, Council in South America, and it's also in uh, the USA. The USA one, however, has been uh, renamed to the Broadband, Broadband, Broadband Forum, I think, and so forth. And recently, the FTTX Council is in, in Africa have changed their name to the Digital uh, uh, Council Africa. It is an independent uh, 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 organization not for profit and it uh, have members 
uh, from all over the industry, ISP, FMOs, manufacturer, uh, manufacturer, individual uh, uh, people, suppliers, contractors, and so forth. Uh, next, please. If we look at uh, uh, the, the, the functions of the DCA, uh, it becomes specifically during the last couple of months of the, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic and the lockdown issues, there was a lot of uh, uh, dialogue with, with the government and, and the Digital Council really started to act as a bridge and a connector between the, the, the government, the industry as such, and any other interested party uh, like the developers uh, uh, and or, or, or even uh, uh, the, 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 the end users. Currently, we, uh, we are on a number of, 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 of committees and so forth to advise government on, on how to digitize and how to look at the whole digital era, uh, which is a, a occurring quite in a, in a fast rate and all the challenges that is associated with it. And, and one of the, uh, the big challenges that uh, was mentioned here is, 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 is the cost of it, the civil works on it. And that uh, cost really is being driven down uh, uh, the earlier that we start putting in this infrastructure as such. Uh, we, <clears throat> we actually see uh, 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 infrastructure, and specifically a fiber infrastructure, almost... Uh, you will probably have uh, um, recognized or, or heard it before as the fourth, fourth uh, uh, utility, uh, electricity, water, sewage, and then obviously communications. And in the old days, uh, you will always, uh, when it was still a monopoly uh, by telecom, uh, buildings that have been uh, designed and, and built was was always there's always provision made for the so-called telecom room where they could have installed equipment and connect to the network now that is that concept that we must just bring out wider as such now it is very important that it uh, that that most of the homes or 100 percent of the homes is the is is obviously the goal and the dream to do it uh, to have fiber connectivity uh, into it because the changes in 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 in, in the communications in, in commentations for the for the homes is really mind-boggling the, the the consumer demands is really increasing in terms of content interactive uh, video uh, video services e-services like education and surveillance security access control uh, name it and, and, and there's communications. People talk about a, a smart city, but smart city is basically just the collection of data. Really, to be a smart city, there must be a network. To have a smart estate, to have a smart complex means you must have a network uh, that, 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 that can carry all that information uh, uh, where it, the data can be analyzed into valuable information and so on. And that requires computing power, storage of data and so forth. And that, therefore, a network is, is necessary. So any smart city and so on cannot be smart if there is not a network. And that is a very important thing. I think uh, one of the points at a long time that's been raised a couple of times between uh, uh, from a, a number of presentations that I had had from from the government or the local governments is is this uh, view of of how can we make money out of that and if you want to dig in my streets how can I make money I think it is very important that uh, that that uh, that that question being addressed quite actively uh, around all the role players uh, my standard answer to to this uh, environment is that if you if you allow a, a fno to implement a, a, a digital network a fiber network in your town basically that uh, that investment can be anything from 100 to 300 million rand uh, in small towns and larger towns it, it goes up uh, easily to six seven hundred million million rand so that's a huge investment in a in a in a in a company, and obviously there must be some 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 
uh, uh, way to 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 uh, um, get some yield on 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 that capital that's being employed in that area. But the real value for a town council is once that is in, it is starting to 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 uh, uh, encourage and 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 support businesses, new businesses, new residents coming in. The property values is going. Uh, 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 is, is, is increasing, rates and taxes is increasing. So the long-term benefits of a town with a good network is 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 undisputable. I mean, there is many, many, many uh, 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 case studies, specifically in the USA, uh, specifically one between two towns that was about 30, 40 kilometers from apart. The one was almost dying, the other one was flourishing. And the only difference between the towns was that the one was fiber connected in every home in, in that area. So for property developers, uh, I think it is it is it is almost a sin these days if any property developer starts to implement uh, uh, or, or start to plan and, and and construct a new development, whether it is a, a large estate, whether it's apartment blocks, whether it is a number of of freestanding homes as such, with not bringing in the the uh, 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 concept and the design of how the network is going uh, uh, to feed every and uh, every possible uh, uh, apartment or uh, living unit in that uh, development. And the and and the nice thing about it, if you do it at that stage, the the capital cost for the civils is coming down almost 40 percent uh if you if you do it that stage one, because once you start going into uh current uh, environments where where there's a established thing down there and you start digging everybody have that pain of digging and water being uh, uh cut off electricity be cut off and whatever is being done the cost in that the, the repair of pavements the sagging of pavements and so on it is just uh, uh it is it is just uh, uh, not not sensible not to start putting those things in once uh, uh, in any planning. So that is one of the DCSA uh, uh, real objectives in that area is is to foster uh, that whole idea that it's a valuable asset to put in. It makes it more sellable. It increases the value of 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 the homes as such and it is very important that there is a telecommunications expert or representative on the so-called professional team normally these developers got a professional team architects electrical engineers mechanical engineers civil engineers uh, uh, the the quantity surveyors and so forth and it's important at that stage already that uh, the that uh, uh, the um uh, 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 Telecommunication operator is is, is uh, not the operator, but the telecommunications consultant is in, involved in that team to to co coordinate that work. And that also go for 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 the government areas as such. It is it is really concerning for me. So if I look at how many roads are being fixed, how many new roads are being built, and no, there is not being made provision for the contract on that to. To, uh, to 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 put in sleeves and or ducks along the road, across the road, and so forth. Uh, to give you an idea, to cross a road today at a busy thing, you can pay anything anything from about 500 rand to about 3,000 rand a meter to do a drill underneath a, 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 a road. If you re-establish uh, re a road or you build a new road, it will cost you almost less than 50 rand a meter. To, uh, to do that crossing so it is it is it is definitely one of the main uh, uh, arguments why that should be done at that stage so it is the digital council really to look at this uh, 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 thing to to bring up the 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 issue of uh, the fourth the fourth communication of uh, the fourth utility and uh, uh, and and the reason for that uh, if any new home is being built at this stage there's plans that be, must be approved. Part of that approval is to make sure there's a telecommunications outlet. There's a termination point for that. That 
point is there's there's ducting in there from there towards the street to connect just like you would connect your electricity just like you would uh, have a sewage connection just like you will have a water connection that should be part and parcel of the approval process of a plan for a new home to be built uh, uh, as as such so that is what we're trying to do and to do that there should uh, there should exist standards standards and, and and specifications so so the the dca is working along that lines to get standards and uh, specifications uh, uh, right although we cannot enforce those things because the dca is, uh, uh, is does not have that mandate we can ha make them available and can basically uh, 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 have it as a recommendation and that that is the sort of specifications that should be included into uh, into any property developers plans as uh, if he does it the other point uh, that comes in and uh, marius have mentioned it on on the quality control of it uh, obviously like all the industries you get the cowboys in this industry and uh, and uh, up to now the fiber industry is really not regulated in any sense anybody can 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 buy himself a machine and call him a contractor and he's a splicer and so forth so it it it, it creates it uh, obviously creates a uh, uh, bad workmanship, bad uh, experiences for some, uh, and so on. So the DCA is looking at a body or a, a chapter in it where we would like to start to have a sort of a certification process of of contractors in the in 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 the um, uh, 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 sphere of uh, installation of the the the, the uh, infrastructure where where we can basically make sure that. That, uh, that the members or the contractors that uh, registered and certify they have at least uh, the, the the test equipment that's required have at least some experience uh, or, or, or so on, and have the capabilities in so uh, so so almost like like uh, uh, the the current uh, national um, home uh, uh, home constructors union is is working but the home constructors uh, uh, association is actually by law there so it will actually be excellent if they uh, bring in uh, 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 as they have constructors for homes bringing in uh, the 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 uh, 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 contractors for for fiber installation so with that in mind we look at the digital council's vision you can read it for yourself there uh, we believe that this is definitely uh, the way that the, the the future the communications which will enhance uh, the quality of life for everybody uh, in South Africa. Next, please. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, mission. Yeah. So, so as uh, we said, is 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 that this is uh, we see that uh, that telecommunications is an important economy driver of growth and innovation. Maybe we should tell it for the president's selected uh, for his uh, thing. He's currently busy. Uh, uh, giving the, the development plan and a, a little bit I heard of it already, they are making pr uh, provision for broadband connectivity. It is important to realize that because kind of, uh, when uh, this whole uh, bubble started in uh, 2014 really was the first FTTH, uh, again before that was really it was a business environment and then uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, FTTH started uh, at, at that stage uh, because it was expensive, uh, just the, the very high income uh, zones were, were targeted. But you can see that it is going uh, more and more towards the lower income areas. And if we specifically look, look at these uh, 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 mega city projects that the, that the, the government is looking at, uh, there's a number of them that is identified. I think that is that should be a mandate that uh, uh, connectivity should be built in, or at least the sleeving and and that information. Next slide, please. I've talked uh, quite a long. I'm not. Uh, I'm going to go quite uh, uh, quite fast over here. If you look at uh, this whole new working from home, uh, uh, there's new services that create new uh, revenue streams. And, and, and that uh, drives new devices. It changes end user behavior. I mean, 
four uh, four months five months ago uh, there was a lot of people uh, uh, well most of the people didn't even know the name zoom or microsoft teams these days it is a household known to do that and and that in turn is going to drive increased bandwidth and that uh, in turn is going to drive network upgrades and fiber is eventually really at this size the only solution uh, to, to handle in the long term future the the bandwidths that we're going to see even to support uh, uh, new technologies like the 5g uh, uh, rollouts will which will soon in the next uh, four years will take take place next slide please Okay, uh, I will skip this slide. So quite as I, uh, I've discussed it a lot, it's one of our objectives to, to promote that fiber. So on. Oh, you can skip this one as well. I think it's a, a, a double. So, so if we look at the, 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 the benefits, there's a number of benefits that, that FTTH uh, is, is improving life and, and bringing benefits to it. It is boosting economic growth. Uh, it enhances the community's ability to uh, attract and retain businesses. It increases their skills, their information, their employment opportunities, as Marius just have indicated to them. If he did not have fiber, he probably would not have renewed his contract with uh, we. It uh, uh, will increase efficiency of, of public services, including health, uh, education, health, where we all know about all this, the, uh, the, the, the things that uh, gone on in the past as such. And then there's like this, uh, like the, like the, the the smart city in terms of traffic and even pollution. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give a this uh, is a is a, is a, a, a illustration from Alcatel Lucent. Um, uh, at that stage, I think uh, Alcatel Lucent is now Nokia. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, just to give everybody an idea where it fits in, you uh, you get a couple of layers in, in this thing. So you will hear the people talk about layer one. That is the passive infrastructure. That is the physical civil trenches, the ducts that you put in, the manuals that you put in, and the fiber cables that you install, and then the the, the, the enclosures to, to, to splice or connect uh, those fiber cables together. On top of that, once that fiber infrastructure is there, there's an active network that is the physical equipment. That's the router that's standing in your home. That's that equipment rooms that uh, Marius have shown you. And that is really to build a network. Then on top of and, and, and on top of that is the, the services, the uh, 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 services industry that is for residential public service, business services. That is where you actually connect to your internet and then it's end users. So it's just a very simple diagram to, 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 uh, to, to, to uh, and visualize how this network is putting together. Now, if you look at that next slide, please, you can see the different models. That's the business models that is applicable to that. If you look at uh, the uh, uh, left hand side, there you see the model, the retail service, the active network, the passive network. And uh, if you look at the vertical integrated and uh, the four type of models, they vertically integrated, meaning there's an operator that do everything of that day. Eh? They own the retail services, they have the active network, and they, uh, uh, they've installed the passive network. So there is right. So, and there's a competition on the infrastructure. So uh, a second uh, operator or telecommunications operator is installing exactly the same. This is what we actually want to avoid as, uh, uh, as far as possible. It is the most competitive environment. But it is the uh, environment that will go the most slowest because there is huge capex uh, there, and it does not make sense to 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 duplicate capex in, in a country in South Africa where where we cannot really afford uh, uh, to do the, uh, something double there. So the first part of it, where where you see a, a sort of a sharing, is that there's one infrastructure owner. There's a a, 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 a fiber cable. A, a network fiber network operator that installs the cable and he releases out those cables to a number of 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 uh, 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 
um, other operators that actually imp implement the active part of it and the retail services. Typically, in, in our environment, I don't, I don't, this is where uh, this is how Dark Fiber Africa started. The whole mission of Dark Fiber Africa at that stage was to install to install ducks and things, to put in cables, and actually to lease out a, a, a one of the fibers in that cable to a, to an operator, which then. Uh, uh, put uh, the, install some equipment at the ends of that fiber and make that live and so forth. Now, the, the, the model that is mostly in South Africa currently is the active sharing uh, 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 model. And everybody I've heard the names of open access. Uh, this is basically, uh, it is open access in the sense that 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 there's, a, there's one FNO that, uh, that's, that, that, that owns the passive infrastructure as well as the the active network infrastructure on top of that. And there is a, a number of, of ISPs, uh, service providers that is uh, renting connectivity from him and selling it to the end user. And I believe that most of the people around this uh, that's attending this webinar with uh, services will have good experience of this because they will see that the, the fiber network operator in the, the area is X and they buying from different they can from cool ideas, every house. To what there's a myriad of of uh, of thing. Uh, a typical uh, 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 operator like this is one of our panelists here from OpenServe. OpenServe is a vertical infrastructure provider, and they're selling the services to ISPs. And then uh, if you go, you can go further where you have the full separation. So uh, the 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 business model that's currently mainly. Uh, driven in South Africa is the active sharing uh, open access model that is down there. And uh, it, it is not the most comp competitive uh, uh, model because the most competitive thing is the vertical integrated, but the vertical integrated, our country cannot afford that. Not even America. If you look at America, you will see that there is areas. This is a this is a, a area from that operator and this is an area from that operator. And then there is service providers. Uh, next uh, slide, please. This is just to give you the pros and cons of it. And uh, it is relatively uh, 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 easy to, to understand us. N next, please. Then uh, just as a thing down there, I, I think uh, I'm not so sure who is all aware of it, but there is a very nice document that has been been, been, been compiled by the FTTH Council Europe. Uh, the first edition was uh, launched was was launched in 2013. The latest edition is launched in 2016, and uh, and and it's free for for download. Uh, 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 so anybody can download it. You go to uh, the website. I think uh, uh, on the uh, on the chat box the the the, the link is will be given down there, but it is a really, I can recommend this, this guide uh, as for all, all of, for the municipalities, utilities, uh, telecom operators, such as the, the real estate developers, residential associations, and, 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 and so forth. And even it gives you the, the investment guides on that. So I would recommend really to look at that. And just to close down as the last thing, I think it, what is very important in this uh, area uh, where we build it and, 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 and it would require a lot of dialogue and so forth is the ownership of infrastructure, specifically not in the public uh, uh, public spaces where you ask for a way leaf and you build it and it's your own. But uh, when you get into when you get into estates or, 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 or sectional title developments, strictly speaking, any infrastructure in that uh, 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 complex as such becomes the owner of the body corporate. So the the the, move, uh, the immovable infrastructure, meaning the sleeves, the manuals, is the property of the of of the body corporate once it is handed over, and then the body corporate can allow any F and O really to install cables or ducts in that infrastructure to provide things and it's an important concept that uh, so there's a number of law cases that's been that's been on and so on but uh, the guiding principle that's coming out of that is that such infrastructure is the uh, property of the body corporate and and, and any fno can get 
permission from a body corporate to really install it on on the public side it's not so and uh yes that is all that i have to say i think i've a little bit went over my time quite a lot i'm sorry about that louise no problem i think it's a huge topic and um and out of what you've been saying i've been jotting down a whole lot of questions but i think what led us here from the other sides of the panel and we can and we can put these questions uh at the end and i i do see that there's some questions coming in so hendrik we are seeing your questions we will uh, uh, have a look at it uh, from the panel perspective towards the end I think what we've definitely established is the passion and and um, and that the digital council has got a mandate and they are and and the intention and and what we see coming up are words like legislation the approval process standardization certification you know and and to be able to start regulating the industry so that the levels are, and standards that are produced are 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 right uh, a big part of what we find, and thank you so much, Eugene, and a big part of what we find is often for homeowners associations or estates or developments or complexes or anything, they might be outside of the reach of their of their particular um, of where the, 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 the fiber is currently installed and and how do they get to that fiber and i think this is really where municipalities start to play such an integral role of the bigger picture so we are very 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 pleased today to have salgo here with us moses from Zizwe, thank you so much and uh, for coming through or for being here and for giving us some insight of what local government and how local government is going to be supporting a collaboration that we're talking about where all the different parties are coming together because, because we need local government and we need the building sector on our, together in this collaboration. And um, so what, what, what your role would be and um, you know what importance have you given uh, Fiber? I mean, as the director of the digital, uh, of the digital division within Salga, I'm sure this is your your number one priority. Um, Moses, let me let me hand over to you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, uh, we, Louise? We can hear you and, and we can see you. Absolutely. Oh, you can see me. Oh, no, no. I, Good. Yeah. <laughs> we can't see you, but we can see your uh, your presentation. Presentation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Eugene. Number one for such a long uh, presentation that is actually cut across uh, our area as well, which is uh, the nature of the beast, as it were. Uh, okay. Uh, first, to start, uh, my name is Moses Msizi. I'm attached uh, to the South African Local Government Association, Municipal uh, ICT's Directorate, uh, now called uh, Salga Digital. <clears throat> A uh, 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 mine is to actually um, uh, take up from where uh, Eugene has left off, because Eugene has put actually all the technical um, uh, uh, side of things, as it were, all the nitty gritties of uh, the foundations of a smart city, as it were. Uh, but where Salga comes in uh, 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 is 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 on the legislative uh, uh, part of uh, this particular agenda. Uh, uh, I mean, going forward. Uh, well, well. Number one, Salga was actually formed in 1996. It's a, it's a constitutionally uh, formed body to lobby and um, uh, what work 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 with the the, the, the local local government uh, space. I mean, I mean, as it, I mean, as it were. All right. But specifically, uh, 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 in this uh, smart cities development uh, approach and agenda. One is looking at, um, uh, for instance, uh, wait, 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 what, what, what does the constitution, constitution say regarding the what you call uh, the, the, the the role of um, municipalities and or um, uh, the optifibra in, in in shaping and forming what you call this smart uh, cities uh, agenda going forward. Okay, so 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 ours now as Salga is to actually make sure that whatever Eugene was saying and the earlier presenter is actually legislated legislated, and is actually uh, the, leg the legislation that we're putting uh, 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 on the ground now is actually f future proof to speak also to what we call the fourth industrial revolution. 
which is encompassing all various departments, all government departments, all forms and shapes of lives uh, that, 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 what, what is it going to say, for instance, I mean, um, based on COVID, uh, based on um, uh, 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 what? I mean, I mean, going forward, the, the, the future cities that, 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 basically, that basically we are uh, actually developing going forward. Okay. Um, this, part, this particular slide is referring to um, what the, 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 the old uh, special planning and loose, uh, rather land use uh, management act. Okay, uh, which actually shapes and uh, uh, says that okay, what uh, should municipalities do actually uh, 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 in, in in planning a what we call a, a a city or a town or a, what services should be there, where should they be, that kind of thing. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. The, 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 this very slide speaks to um, uh, what we call the, the, the Spluma law, Spluma, Spluma, Spluma being a special uh, planning and land use uh, management act. Okay, next slide. The slide that we're actually missing uh, before this one, okay, is, 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 is the one on what we call an integrated uh, urban uh, development framework that uh, Cocta as well as Salga has, okay, as, as to how do you um, plan your cities, I mean, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, development uh, uh, going forward. Uh, um, it refers to um, the, 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 the urban cities, as it were, okay? Uh, it refers to urban development, where, where you actually um, uh, add what Eugene was referring to earlier on uh, in terms of process, uh, processes, processes, um, uh, legislation uh, in terms of uh, where, uh, where 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 their developmental goals are going, right? Because he just mentioned, for instance, that I mean, in the fiber industry, uh, uh, much as they have a what we call an, a a memorandum of agreement or, 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 or understanding with Salga as, as partners in in the deployment and the development of these smart cities uh, using their tools. Okay, there is no uh, legislation, or, or, or rather, or rather, the, the, the industry, the, the, the optic fiber industry, is not necessarily necessarily legislated, if I may put it that way. All right. Uh, so, so our role now is to uh, have those collaborative um, uh, partnerships and um, uh, 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 agreements going forward by law, by law, by law, to ensure that I mean um, uh, there is a, a, a in, an integrated approach uh, to uh, uh, deploying uh, these particular services uh, that actually help and assist municipalities in their, uh, their, their service uh, delivery um, uh, uh, agenda, if I put it that way. Okay? Right? And it, it's a slide that we're actually missing here is um, uh, a slide on uh, what we call a district model uh, deployment approach. On all these services, because I mean, we see all these things. I mean, happening and are going. I mean, in your Johannesburg, your Tswane, your 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 this thing, your Egorulene, wherever, all the urban centers. Okay, uh, the, the 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 district municipalities, or rather, your local municipalities. I mean, in the periphery, secondary cities, towns uh, like your your Nelspruit, for instance, are usually I mean left behind. If I put it that way. So, so the slide that is actually missing on this one is to is to actually when when we are legislating we're legislating all these um, 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 uh, agendas or other developmental agendas using fiber this that and other uh, in this uh, this thing there should be a standardized and or a uniform uh, approach uh, to say to say to, to I mean to say I mean how do we deploy these uh, these things uh, 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 these services I mean across the country uh, to to have an even feel. If I may put it that way, that, that, that basically refers to uh, what I mentioned earlier on that um, the, the, the type of collaboration and legislation that we like to put is a future proof legislation. I mean, um, I mean, uh, for, for an example, we're talking now, for instance, um, a 5G, I mean, in the horizon, um, it is actually here, but there they are already talks about 6G. How, how is this going to work, for instance, I mean, uh, in an area in a, a, Senegal, or, or, or in uh, Mahuba Square, or, or 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 even Moy Grove for that matter, which is a, a 
a mega city being developed uh, across the road uh, in Tswane here. You see? All right. Um, obviously, the, 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 this legislation should actually also speak to what we call uh, the fourth industrial revolution that I've uh, spoken and talked to. And uh, yes, uh, the yeah, the, the, this slide is, re is really about what we call this rapid urban urbanization, uh, lagging um, of the infrastructure rollout, and um, uh, because because there is no specific law, for instance, uh, uh, or, or or rather the law, the existing laws do not necessarily speak to the rapid, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, deployment of infrastructure, if I put it that way. Okay, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, with the with the um, um, FTTH council earlier, uh, uh, before it was changed now to DCA, we were busy with what we call um, uh, in the city of Tswane, uh, micro trenching, for instance, okay, as, as, as one of the alternatives and, and or approach, as it were. That uh, uh, engagement uh, started as early as uh, 2018 in March. Can you believe that it was only signed yesterday, October 13, or if, yeah, 13, 13 October 2020, which is eight, literally 18, 24 months later, basically. So, 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 so there is a, um, what, a, a long delay in, uh, in, in the law process making. Uh, 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 collaborations like these, for instance, I mean, with the with one the industry, the property industry, and uh, I know that we are we are actually looking at uh, maybe developing a white paper regarding um, uh, these um, uh, uh, the laws around uh, these deployment uh, uh, issues that you uh, that 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 you are basically referring to. We welcome that. And uh, we must uh, basically move as fast as possible to ensure that we don't necessarily take now the next 18 months, even if, 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 if not 24, to actually uh, develop uh, 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 laws and, and processes uh, that actually speak to the very developmental agenda that uh, we are dealing with here. We do not necessarily want uh, the, 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 the laws uh, to be grind, rather uh, the what called the service delivery uh, <laughs> issues and matters to be grinded and uh, uh, unnecessarily going forward. I will end it there for now. Thank you. That's Thank my story. You very... <laughs> Thank you very much, Moses. We appreciate your Eugene, invitation. you took you took you took a lot a lot of all of this, yes. So I have to come <laughs> with this uh, uh, legal perspective regarding this one. <laughs> this is, uh, thank you. Yeah, the, thank you so much, Moses. And I, I think you know you've said so many things. And what keeps coming to my mind is exactly what you said at the end. There is that you can't wait another two years before mm. anything comes into place. I mean, the digital divide is growing. You know, especially as we see this at the end of uh, COVID, it's growing so rapidly. Um, just. On an every day, I mean, children who had access to the internet and children who don't have access to the internet are going to have a very different school career um, if we look at the way in which um, we are educating and getting access to information. And and, and you're right, and I, and I have that's why we have to commend Marius and thank you so much for also participating and everyone for participating. That that this white paper will make a change and try and. Um, speed up some of these processes. Legislation takes time, but perhaps a loose, a loose agreement that can be formed in the meantime that will get the ball rolling is really what we hope to hope to get and to get all parties on board. I think the 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 very interesting fact is that municipalities have the ability to, if by rolling out fiber infrastructure to in to Sort of deal with some of the issues that are coming up for property developers that are working in the private space not being able to access connectivity but it also has an amazing opportunity for job development and, and industry growth and, and job opportunity and i think this is really where um, it's important if you look at the the example that 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 we've based a lot of our uh, collaboration on which is happening in the uk the agreement is also between the building sector and that of uh, and the, obviously the telcos so the building sector plays a massive role and the nhbrc is an integral part of that sector um, in south africa 
and which is why uh, we have invited the NHBRC onto this panel. Um, Ruth, are you still still uh, the nurse? Are you still with us? Um, we are. We really want to understand if it's possible. If we are looking at legislation, we're looking at standardization. What about accreditation? If you are able to accredit the builders to be able to do this installation, how will that how will that grow the 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 NHBRC? Um, and what would the role of the NHBRC be in any kind of accreditation when it comes to this collaboration? Um, Nurse Shavalala, you are. Can I hand over to yourself? Maybe it's just unmute yourself. We can't hear you, nurse. Uh, let's try. There we go. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nurse Tawalala from the NHPRC. I'm seeing now this collaboration, we are learning a lot. Yes, I'm the regional manager of the organization. I just want to give you just an overview of who we are, what we do, and what this fiber can add value in our space. Can you move forward, please? Thank you very much. I just took just this uh, circle, which will help me to elaborate on our services. A national Home Builders Registration was established in terms of the Housing Consumer Protection Measures Act, 95 of 1998, as amended in 2007. Our main role is to protect the interest of the housing consumer and also to regulate the home building industry. How do we regulate the home building industry? As you can see there, any builder or contractor who intends to build a house must be registered with us. It's an offense for a builder to start a construction without registering with us. Before you register, NHBRC gives you standards that you must adhere to when you go on site. You must understand how to mix a Daha cement. And after you are registered with the NHBRC, now you must make sure that all the houses that you are, in, you are, you are constructing or building is enrolled with the NHPRC in terms of section 14. So in other ways, for you to put a mortar and a brick on, on the ground, you should make sure that actually your house is enrolled 15 days prior to construction. It's also an offense. You know, you can be jailed one year in prison or you can be charged 25,000 per project. So after your house is enrolled, we make sure that actually the inspections are taking place. Each and every house that is constructed, we have to ensure that the inspection is taking place. In the inspection, maybe I can talk about something that we are doing as, as an organization, as a major milestone. You must remember, we have got the government we have got the municipality, we have got the NHPRC, we have got the bank. We have got different roles that we are playing as institutions. The municipality that was talking before us, their role is to make sure that the bylaws are adhered to. With us, we are responsible in the integrity of the structure to ensure that the structure that is constructed actually meet all the standards and the requirements. After the inspection is conducted, the housing consumer will have to occupy the house. As, as an organization, we are giving a warranty, a five-year warranty. 
This five-year warranty has got three different categories. That is your maintenance and your 12 months roof leak and your five-year structural defects. In cases of structural defects, the builder who have constructed that house who is registered with us, the housing consumer will come and, and lodge a complaint with us and then we will compel you as a home builder to go rectify. And failure to go rectify the house, uh, you will be maybe suspended. Your regist registration can be withdrawn because you have failed to honor your obligation. Uh, the, the second part, after your house is enrolled, uh, you will have a uh, complaints. Complaints now is after the housing consumer have occupied the house. You will come to us and lodge a complaint, which will compel the builder to go rectify. But in this case, there are situations where a home builder will be failing to uh, rectify the house because we are protecting the interest of the housing consumers as NHPRC. We can go and rectify the house on behalf of the home builder so that the housing consumer can have peace of mind. And then we can go after the home builder after the house has been uh, uh, rectified. And then there is conciliation, there is remedial work, there is fund. MHPRC is not getting any assistance from government in terms of the grants. You know, we get our budget uh, through the enrollment of homes and also through the, the, the registration and renewal uh, that uh, contractors are doing. I, I have alluded to say it's an offense for a home builder to commence with construction prior for you in uh, 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 registering and enrolling. On enrollment, I want just to mention one thing that is very critical. You see, Section 80, 18 of that Act stipulates that conveyances cannot even register the house if uh, it is not enrolled. The banks cannot give any finance to the housing consumer or allow the builder to participate uh, in the construction of their houses if the house is not enrolled. So in the this office, uh, we are also uh, having access to access any information pertaining to any registration of the houses. So there is nowhere where any person can run to. Uh, you have to come back and make sure that you enroll the house so that you can able to uh, participate. Let's say you fail to enroll the house, what happens? There is late enrollment, which attracts a financial guarantee. It's not a good thing. I always dis discourage builders actually to late enroll because you there are a lot of things that is required and the financial guarantee most of the people are failing to uh, actually to, to 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 get that uh, uh, financial uh, guarantee paid to us and now the housing consumers house remain incomplete because of that and i always discourage that so on a high note that is who we are as an organization and we, we, we are having that relationship with the builder also we are offering training to the people who are registered with us to their laborers just to ensure that they comply with all the standards and the requirement within the organization we do have a, 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 our training center a, a, a center for excellence that is responsible with training can you move forward, please? Yeah. Next slide. You know, I just want to talk about some of the major milestones that we have achieved as an organization. Seeing that, you know, we are regulatory in the building industry. Seeing that some of the people can fail to come and comply because of the vast geographical extent. 
We have ensured that we have established satellite offices in all our provincial offices to ensure that people can access our services without struggling. We, we, we also had a mobile bus that was uh, roaming around. On the briefing date, I indicated that actually, you know, we are having challenges in the rural areas. Those people can access most of our services. Most of the houses are not enrolled because of the nature of, 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 of that tribal land. What did we do as an organization? We are trying our level best to partner uh, with municipalities. You know, I'm happy municipalities is here. Uh, we partner with municipalities to, sh to ensure that we, are, you know, we, we, we do awareness in those areas where they cannot access our services. What, what is it that this fiber will do to those areas in the rural areas? What is needed is the infrastructure that will be uh, that can be placed there so that each and every person who will need to access this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the services can easily access it. It will be cheaper in terms of utilizing data. The bus was going throughout all nine provinces including in our rural areas where we were doing uh, actually awareness programs to ensure that we don't leave them out. One of the things that we are doing uh, as an organization, um, I want to jump now online services. Um, I want to talk about public-private partnership. It is not only a, 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 a private partnership, public and private partnership that we are doing. As I'm talking to you today, I can assure you that as an organization, seeing that there is a gap in the rural areas, we have just signed an MOU with a, 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 a house of traditional leaders. Why did we sign with that MOU with traditional leaders? Is to ensure that the people in the rural areas also benefit from uh, uh, all the services that is always benefited by the people who are living in the rural areas. We want to see them accessing proper services. We want to make sure that the houses that are constructed in the rural areas are actually receiving all attention, like the houses in the, in the urban areas. So we have partnered with a house of traditional leaders. We are just waiting for Salga to finalize the, 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 the MOU as I'm talking to you right now. It's, it's just the NHBRC uh, uh, site, the MOU has already been signed. We're just waiting for the municipality to come on board and make sure that uh, they sign. After they've signed, then we know that all the municipalities they are responsible with what? They are responsible with the approval of plans. That is part of our requirements when a home builder comes to us and want to register. So that partnership will help us to integrate our services. Like the banks, the bank can access our services by clicking the button and see houses that are enrolled. They wouldn't just request home builders to go and produce the enrollment certificate. We want them to access all our services just being in the bank. We want the municipality to NHBRC to access those approved plans. You know there are fraudulent activities that is happening today. People produce plans that is not actually approved by the municipality. They just got the stamp somewhere. We want as an organization to integrate our services, including the Department of Human Settlement. You know, for us to construct sustainable uh, human settlement, we need to have uh, uh, the department mu must know what NHBRC is doing. We are reporting to them all what uh, we are constructing as houses. We are telling them this is the houses that we are 
uh, constructed. In all big developments where houses are being constructed, NHBRC must form part of those uh, developments so that we ensure that there is compliance. Our housing consumer must not end up occupying houses that are constructed in places that is not actually uh, uh, possible uh, to, to, to occupy. No, so I'm so sorry to interject. Um, our, our webinar is coming to an end at uh, 4.30, so we're a little short on time. Um, I really think that the, the message that is coming through there is that the role that the NHBRC plays in enforcing legislation around uh, the building industry and securing those homes for both securing the environments for both the builders and for the end user consumer and this just reinforces what we've been saying that having a, a set of uh, legislation legislation and standardization when it comes to fiber rollout is so important because again another party such as or your party such as the NABRC will be able to enforce those um, rules through your process that you have and, and by bringing in, you know, uh, that urban edge and the outreaching uh, areas that then again will propel municipalities to to try and get that fiber resource out. And I thank you so much. And I'm so sorry to interject. I hate doing that. But I am. Um, I, we I really would like to also hear from Mike Force, who's uh, with Open Server. Now, I love putting the operators in the hot seat. Uh, Mike, I, 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 you, I know you're not bringing any slides so we could move to our to uh, to um, to hearing you what you have to say um something that always comes up when it comes to fiber rollout is uh, you know is getting is getting the um getting the fiber to the the dwellings to the homes um to the out, uh, re, you know the areas that are outside of the urban edge and something that always comes up over and over again is uptake if there's no uptake then it, it it's not uh it, it doesn't show it hasn't got the kind of economic opportunity that an operator is looking for um perhaps i can just hand over to you i'm sorry guys we're a bit short on time and uh, and following you mike is eugene just to wrap us up um thank you again nurse for coming through today and we appreciate your input uh, mike if i can hand it over to you okay thank you louise uh, yeah, thanks for the other speakers before me. I will help Louise to make up some time, so I'll try not to repeat too much of what they said. Then, um, I think from operator side, uh, Louise started now the discussion maybe with take up. So take up is a huge issue for us because um, Marius and Eugene both alluded to the fact that there's a lot of capital going into this development um, for getting infrastructure in the ground. So I want to start from, from that perspective, from the investment perspective and say the infrastructure deployment is extremely capital expensive um, and, and we need a payback period that runs over 5 to 10 to 15 years, which is similar to what people normally think when they start buying a house, it's, it's something you, you buy and you stay there for five or 10 or 15 or 20 years even. I mean, a bond is, I think, by standard 20 years. I don't know if it's already longer or whatever, but that was the norm when, when I used to have a bond. So you, you sit in a situation where there's um, long-term things, roads and power and, and, and water and things that come in that are all paid over a long term, mostly I would assume paid either by a council and, and then there's rates and taxes that get uh, sort of by the council for putting that infrastructure in place. Or with most of these private developments going on lately, the developers do funding and then they secure uh, funding to provide this infrastructure. So we need to work in a partnership uh, to get broadband and connectivity also run in that sort of similar model. Now, what makes it a bit more complex, but I, I assume it would be as complex with water and, and roads as well. I mean, every every plumber or every water supplier may use their own standard of pipes, their own pressure and, and everything else that goes with it. So if there's not a standard, it's not going to work for everyone. And the same with Telco stuff. OK, so OpenSurf would use a certain standard to deploy fiber to the home or fiber services. And it may not be the same. Um, 
standard or technology used by some of the other fixed network operators. There may be small differences. So a duct is the same and maybe the fiber strand is the same, but the active equipment on the edge is not the same. And I think what needs to happen here is that operators or network providers need to work with the developer upfront to say, okay, this deployment for this development is going to require X, X amount of capital. Let the property developer fund that upfront because they committed to the development just by having the geographic location, the land and all of that. It's there, it's committed. Let the operator then um, run the network for that period uh, of 10 or 15 years, let's say by contract, and then there can be a recovery from the the developer uh, from the, the, let's say, the property owner. So when you sell a property, if I take today's prices, 100 meg fiber service at, at wholesale level, and I cannot disclose what wholesale pricing is, but I can tell you for between about 50 and 100,000 Rand, you will be able to, let's say, buy your infrastructure um, to connect a home for 10 to 15 years. Okay, so the, now only the, the cost of the ISP is there. So I'm, I'm talking about open access. So having the connectivity there is the same as having your water or your electricity connectivity there. How much you use and who you choose to use maybe as your electricity or your water supply is not maybe the, much of a choice, but it could soon be. But if you, if you choose now a different ISP, you will pay for your service over that. You'll pay maybe for a media supplier or media content provider, and that's the same. So I think we need to look at that sort of models, but I then quickly want to skip over a couple of things that I, that I had in line, um, but covered by mostly Marius and Eugene. But I would like to go back into the whole development environment. So there is a, is a big development normally, especially if you move outside of the metro areas and, and in this, I think the new world that we're going into now, there is a, I, I like it. I mean, it's. it's I, I hope to never need to go into town, but it, it, there's some other excitement to that as well. But to not have a neighbor close to you or to not have traffic congestion is is, is something that is just up my street. So um, what we need to think about is the rest of this development. It may be mixed use. It may not just be residential fiber to the home. Okay, so there may be some small or light commercial like a shop or two there may be business offices because people may want offices close or in the estate so where the estate may in the past only had a clubhouse and maybe a small snack shop now maybe a good part of the development could be an office space which could be rented out but you may need good and proper uh, connectivity there within the estate especially these larger estates there's um, a lot of ground to cover and a lot of open spaces, especially if there's uh, parks and, and, and golf courses and, and things like that. There will be a requirement from the mobile network operators uh, and, and whoever there's, there's now, uh, let's say, requirements put out by the regulator for a wireless open access network provider and new spectrum and all sorts of things that came into the, the, the industry in the last two weeks. So a WON, a wireless open access network provider, also need to build 5G towers. Now to build a 5G tower every couple of hundred meters, property developers need to think about where will you place a tower in an estate? You cannot just pitch a tower. There need to be connectivity at that point. There need to be power at that point. Okay, there need to be maybe security at that point. And those sort of things need space, it need power and it need connectivity. So even community Wi-Fi in the area, if you if you consider things like that, but this mixed business environment with 5G and things going up uh, will require maybe a lot more commitment from the start of to say, how do we make provision for this telco infrastructure need to go in, not just from a wireless or from a wired network provider or a fiber network provider, but also the wireless people wanting to put up masts. It is it's been in the media in the last week or two where uh, by some uh, acts of the telecoms act a mobile operator can literally force you to put a mast in your in your on your property and and pay you some compensation but you don't want to go to that extent rather make provision for this upfront in the development and everything is sorted and then maybe just to to look at a last couple of points here is um connectivity now into the house Okay, so first of all, there need to be connectivity at street level. So when there's empty ground, you cannot terminate. A 
this is where maybe people like the NHBRC is going to play a, a bigger role is to where must the telco box end up okay in the house because i would as a as a network operator want to have a place where i can go the day that the house goes for occupancy certification is to say now broadband is active in the house whether the isp is connected is not my problem okay um they will come as soon as the the, the occupants move in and they start their life there but the same as when you switch on electricity, I want to switch on broadband and it's there and it's tested. But that broadband point need to be also close to a power point in the house. Okay, this is now where regulation come in. So how far can it be away from a power point or how close can it be to a power point? Where must it be in the house? Not centrally because then it, it may create difficulties to access it. But that's part of the architect and the, the designers of the house to decide where they want to place this point. But I think there need to be minimum standards to have that in. And then um, maybe just to go outside as well, automation, security fencing and, and automation of the whole estate or the property development. It may be irrigation, it may be security and fencing and all of that. That need to be available from day one. And it's it's a lot of infrastructure that need to go in and be activated and, and Morris have shown what equipment rooms can look like and that would be typically something that I would want a property developer to make space for on the property outside of site where, wherever you can hide it is better um, but making full function capabilities uh, ready for use and then something that I alluded to yesterday was um, redundancy so many of these property developers um, now go to the outskirts of the metro areas and there is not a lot there. So to get there, we need to install from a network perspective, a 10 gig, 100 gig, or even more capacity to that site. Now to have a 100 gig link underground or overhead, but preferably underground, is still a high risk because if that one link goes down, the whole estate is, is rendered useless. So we need to look at multiple entry points, multiple redundancies for things like this to make sure it's, it's, it's safe. And even if at that network level i would not call it the local access but maybe access to the property um, or the whole development may need to come from multiple suppliers if i was a property developer i would say maybe two two network providers to provide pro uh, connectivity there um, just for that redundancy um, they could also be full redundancy from a single network operator but that's that's part of the the property developers and what they want to secure the the residents or the, the owners of land in that space to, to get the benefit from. I think the um, this whole value proposition of I have a house without water or without electricity is, is the same as having a house without broadband. Okay, so we cannot live lately without this. And then I think we need to build that into the whole development cycle, but it's not as simple as to say the property developer must do it. It must be in collaboration with the network providers um, one or multiples of those and then um, service providers can come on top of that because with open access I think we leave the choice to the end customer but the infrastructure is there and and uh, I will check again on questions but uh, that that is the short I try to cut out as much as I can Louise Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate it. And you've actually said so so many points. And, and yet again, just re-emphasizing the role that the NHBRC would play in in um, ensuring that the the building guidelines and the standards are adhered to. And interestingly enough, your collaborative model that you mentioned, where property developers and and telcos work together in collaboration one could almost venture to say that municipalities and telcos could work together in a similar collaboration but i won't um i won't go down that road because i might get myself into trouble um i think let's bring it all back home so let's speak to the speak to the folks that actually um that actually are trying to make the change and spearheading the campaigns to connectivity Eugene, I uh, thank you so much for being so patient and joining us right at the end. Eugene is from the Eland Group, and uh, they've built estates such as Zimbiti, which is a, it is just absolutely a phenomenal development, um, absolutely beautiful, well run, incredible premises, so many opportunities there, um, and and similarly Blythedale, uh, which we can see on the shot. So Eugene, I'm going to hand over to you. 
uh, and we can just talk a lot about some of the some of the challenges that developers are facing right now every day when it comes to rolling out their fiber infrastructure hi louise and thank you very much for having us on it's uh, been a uh... I know it's been a long sort of get through to get to where we are, and it's been interesting to hear um, all the conversation going through to where we are now. I'm not really going to focus too much on the slides, so Julia, you can drop that off there. Thank you. I'm just going to sort of go straight into where we are um, and try and sort of round up from a, from a development's point of view as to where we are. Uh, from a development point of view, and I'll use and I'll use some of the stuff that we have been involved in historically, and and, and also where we are in the future. I think that the, the the main idea of what you, what what is being said from everyone is that massive amount of collaboration. That collaboration is exceptionally important, and there's a huge amount that needs to be put into this. And I think that if anyone was sitting on the outside, I think that what you could take away from all of this is how much work goes into actually determining what the end user is going to have. And that's amazing because now he has a forum that you can actually look at it. Because when you get home and you turn your TV on, your, your Apple TV just works naturally. And the children are able to get onto uh, how the kid low land and all the stuff that they do use now. I mean, we, we, we are so connected in terms of where we are today. If you had to just consider even the fence that you put around an estate, that needs to be connected in some way. The videos that are, that are, that are put onto the fence from a, from a streaming point of view. That means every security person that's employed to look after that estate, where they walk, how they, they, they link in, where they're situated on the estate, all of that is connected. I mean, the, the, I mean, the IoT, the internet of things that now exist, it can be your microwave, your, your, your television, your fridge, your dishwasher, all that stuff is able to get onto the internet. Now, if, if, we, if we just consider that as where we are, we have to try and future-proof. And I think Mark put it quite succinctly when he spoke about the fact that you've, you've got a massive payoff period for a house. So if you get to live in a place for, for a good couple of years and at least pay it off over a couple of years, you expect that house to be able to adapt and grow as you grow. Because I think Marius and Eugene were talking about to come and dig up roads when the space is existing and, and mess up what you've put in big gardens and all the rest of it. That's a massive issue because that cost is just exponentially put out there. So when we build, we have to future proof. We build way into the future. Uh, I mean, I spoke when we spoke about it in our, in our practice session, we were highlighting with Zimbiti. Zimbiti, it took eight years for, for the infrastructure that was put into the ground to actually get used. So we had to try and see around the corner as to what was going to come. So with Blythdale, you know, with Blythdale itself, I mean, we, 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 we take in that place 80% of grid. I mean, IoT plays an important role in terms of how we're setting up and establishing it. So, so we need, need to make sure that what we put into the ground now is scalable. Because logically, I mean, most of us are probably old enough to understand where we are. 16 years ago, Facebook didn't exist. I mean, right now, Facebook is something that we understand as part of our every single day life. So what's going to exist 16 years from now? Can we see around that corner? Can we prepare ourselves accordingly? And can we make sure that whatever we put into the ground now is going to have longevity and still usable, that we don't have to come and dig it all up? So those standards are important. What I'd, what I'd like to caution everybody here and what we, what we probably need to do is we need to find ways to short circuit things. If we're going to layer too many of these things on top of each other where there's too many forums and too many spaces and places that are going to make up rules because everyone has to have their degree of importance we've got to make sure that we don't layer this thing too much we've got to minimize the layers and make it easier for the developers to get out there so when the guy i mean at the end of the guy at the end of the day there's users and there's providers the 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 the, the users are going to pay for what the providers have put in but somebody's got to carry that cost up front. And everyone's looking at us as the developers say, okay, cool, drop the infrastructure, pay the money to put it into the, into the initial place because, well, you'll get it back in a couple of years as you pay it off. Well, when you build a place, and if the place is not near a, a, a sort of a, a commercial center, that means it starts way before where the property ends because if your closest fiber link to, to that area is 30 or 40 k's away or 10 k's away, somebody's got to start that line. 
And that means that somebody's got to take out money out their pocket to make sure that happens. Now, if it's a municipality and that, that area doesn't exist, it's an area that's, 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 that's quite rural. So I value what Nurse and them were saying, you know, going out there and trying to find out and prepare a community for what may or may not come. You do have to find those collaborations, but those collaborations need to be a bit easier and they need to be without too many layers. The conversation is important because at least we're having the conversation with all the people in the same room. And that's a massive, massive plus. So congratulations and well done for doing that. Because I think that's a, that's a good place to start. Um, but what, I, what I'd like to do is that, I mean, that we amazing if we could walk away from this sometime in the future with whatever that white paper is that gets put down as a starting point for a conversation, but more importantly, to actually remove some of the roadblocks that developers and providers have right now today to be able to make these things work. Because just imagine trying to put a pole up on, the, uh, on, on a piece of road or trying to dig up alongside a road to drop anything out here. And I'm sure that Mark would be nodding in, in, in massive agreement here just to get that one pole or that one piece of, 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 of infrastructure done. Is, 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 a, is a massive task and a massive ask, and it requires a huge amount of intervention. So, you know, I think this is a great start. I know that we're a little bit pressed for time, so I'm not going to sort of go into too much, but that's really from a from a developer's side. I mean, we we really would like to see a lot more of a, a lot more ease in terms of trying to get these things done, and it really does help. And knowing that the end user looks at us and realizes that their place that we're building for them must be able to withstand the changes that are going to come. So 16 years from now, whatever the new Facebook is, and it's accessible, accessible to everybody, that they in their own homes can get onto it, do what they need to do, and that we've provided the wherewithal to be able to grow and change with that ever-changing flux of, the, of, of this fourth industrial revolution that we're in. Thank you so much, Eugene. That's a, and thank you. So it's very true. The number of roadblocks that are placed in front of us to between the point of um, to get that fiber in. And you're right. As a homeowner, uh, you don't you don't even take into consideration all the the amount of effort that's gone just to get just to be able to turn the your device on. Um, I think there's been a lot that's been shared today. Um, and again, I just keep going back that everybody to a certain extent is working under the directive of what the legislation says. And it just brings us back home, whether that legislation is directing the way in which houses are constructed, the way in which the infrastructure is, is uh, managed or the way in which it's installed, or for a property developer to have access, quick and effective access, it keeps going back to legislation. Um, Moses, I think as a closing point, and I, unfortunately we need to wrap up, it's the, the time has come to an end. I think these kind of forums just re-emphasize the need for more forums like this. But Moses, mm. if I can just bring it back to you, because so much mm. of what a collaboration that we're discussing today hinges on is the success and the approach of Salga. So having heard, yeah. having heard from the builders, having heard from the developers, the operators, the large organizations like Huawei, um, what is your closing, what would you say in closing um, mm. to where do you think, how do, what is Salga's approach? Do, do you think we will see legislation turn quite quickly and effectively in support of a collaboration such as this? Well, um, good afternoon again, uh, Louise and Tim. Uh, my um, um, semi-closing remarks would be to say that uh, uh, I heard that uh, there will be a uh, what called there will be a, um, a white paper process being um, uh, done or established going forward or something. Uh, what what Salga would um, actually suggest or look at is, for example. Um, what are the existing laws and regulations okay um, uh, that are pertaining now as it were now okay what can be what tweaked and then uh, be uh, what, what 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 basically can be done uh, law wise uh, to actually integrate everything that is existing uh, to avoid now establishing a new law altogether all right. Uh, I mean, I mean, going forward. Okay. Also, uh, what what existing laws uh, that that are there now 
that speak, for instance, uh, to the fourth industrial revolution, which is uh, the new buzzword or rather the new way of doing things. What are the existing laws that are there now that actually speak to COVID, for instance? What are the new laws that can, that can be integrated or done uh, or, or tweaked, for, I mean, for that matter, to speak to the very agenda that, uh, that, that basically we are speaking to here? Okay, and then and then parting short now is that I mean Salga is an organization. We are ready. I mean to collaborate and then uh, talk to um, uh, and uh, uh, talk to these other departments. For for example, I mean um, the Department of Environmental Affairs is involved in uh, what to call uh, in these new developments. Um, the Department of Visit Water and Sanitation, Water Affairs, this that and that. In other words, they, they are all these uh, various stakeholders. Okay, in HPRC, they were talking standards here. I mean, the property developers. I mean, I mean, going forward. So, so in other words, uh, we 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 need to have a follow-up session as it were, um, a, a, a something that speaks to say that what Marias is doing, for instance. Okay, how can we support him? I mean, I mean, from a point of view of the legislation, and then it can be quicker than the 18 months or 24 months that I referred to. In other words, we are here to um, assist. Uh, in in the in knock knocking the correct doors to ensure that uh, the the um, whatever whatever, whatever um, agenda uh, uh, developmental agenda that is being pushed here is actually implemented as fast and as speedily as possible. Thank you. Thank you very. For now. Thank you very much, thank Moses, and thank you very much to everyone. Marius, I think you have uh, your work cut out for you. Um, we we've all heard. Um, Moses's commitment there and the commitment from all the other members and I've got everybody's home numbers so um, we'll be doing a, a we could we can track each other down um, I think this is very exciting uh, and and I'm very grateful to have been able to brought all these parties together um, and I am sorry that we don't have enough time to continue I think that um, you know, we, we've covered a lot of ground, but we definitely can clearly see what could be done to make a change. And the very first step, as Moses has said, is this white paper that uh, Marius is busy on um, that will be uh, shared with everybody at the middle of November and will be discussed um, at our uh, final webinar in this series which happens towards the end of November. And so we can visit, and I think Marius, that would be a fantastic idea. We can revisit some of those findings. It's not a lot of time. I think we're definitely going to, if we want to speed it up, let's speed it up. You know, that's, that's it just needs to be championed. Somebody just needs to champion it. And Marius, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately that's you. Um, thank you so much to everybody for your time today. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all of the attendees for staying with us a little bit over time. I do know that we all have busy afternoons. Please feel free to contact Estate Living. Um, you can uh, send us your emails, send us your questions. We'll send out some surveys. We will do everything we can to get as many, as much feedback from the industry as possible to share with Marius for this white paper. Um, and let's let's hope that this this will uh, change this what has happened to us in 2020 um, let us get some positive out of it in the fact that it would speed up uh, and ensure connectivity for all people in south africa thank you very much to everybody um, julie you can pop that video on and have a wonderful afternoon